lecture that I'll be presenting today is called Building One Shot Semi Supervised Learning, which is also known as BOSS, up to fully supervised performance. So, just to get like a roadmap of what I would be discussing today. Uh, so, the first is intuition. So, what, why did the author, you know, intend to write this paper, then I'll dive into a bit of introduction into the techniques that they've adopted. Then I'll move on to the main methodology that is the BOSS methodology. Then I'll briefly talk about the three things that are main in this paper, which is prototype refining, class balancing, and self-training. Then a bunch of experiments and the results, and then I'll end with conclusion. So to talk about the intuition behind this paper, so in the ML pipeline, it is said that uh, you, this is basically just the percentage of the time allocated in a machine learning project. So about 5% of the time is devoted to data identification, then about 10% to aggregation, and then about 25% to cleansing, and about 25% is taken in data labeling. So what they intend to do is reduce this 25% of the time. So since we know that deep learning has achieved state-of-the-art performance in several vision tasks, but a major barrier is that you have to label huge amounts of data because you need like thousands and hundreds of uh, labeled samples. And this time, uh, it takes a lot of time for you to manually label these samples. So what they want is they want to reduce the time so that you can uh, do this time to all of the other tasks. So to reiterate, the goal here is to reach the performance of a fully supervised learning with unlabeled data so that you don't end up wasting a lot of uh, time labeling this data and only lab labeling one sample per class as opposed to completely labeled data set for uh, deep learning applications. So coming on to understanding what the basic terms in this paper are, I'll just try to give a very brief overview of these terms. The first one is uh, semi-supervised learning. So as we know that supervised, in supervised learning, you have all labeled examples. So for instance, you have uh, 10 examples for a class called CAT. So all of those images will be labeled as CAT. Coming on to uh, semi-supervised learning, you have a bunch of labeled examples, but you also have a bunch of unlabeled examples. So you, every image in your example will not have an associated label with it. So this is uh, what we categorize as semi-supervised learning. Then we have like unsupervised learning, which is you don't have any labeled examples at all. Coming on to the next term, which is a class imbalance. So what this means is that uh, for several classes in your data set, you have a lot of examples for a particular class and relatively smaller uh, number of examples for some other class. So this might create uh, some biases in your model and it might uh, try to predict uh, the class that has more number of examples in your data set as opposed to the ones which have relatively less number of examples in the data set. So this is uh, the problem of class imbalance. Coming on to the next term, which is prototype refining. So what you essentially want to achieve in semi-supervised learning is that you have very less number of labeled example, let's say just one uh, labeled example per class. So you want that to be a very good representation of what you have in that class. So for instance, you want uh, that class as a horse. So you need like a very good representation of the class horse so that if it encounters any kind of a horse, it should be able to label that as a horse. So if you give the first image uh, to the model and you uh, tell it that this is the prototype for uh, the class horse, obviously it won't be able to achieve a very good performance if this is the representation of the class horse. So what the author says is that you go back, you see if you have like very low accuracies for a particular class and you refine it. So obviously this is a better representation of the class horse as compared to this and which would lead to, you know, better accuracy for this particular class. So this is uh, broadly what a uh, prototype refining is. Now that we have like a basic understanding and 
please feel free to stop me whenever you have any questions and I'll try to answer them to the best of my abilities. Uh, coming on to the introduction, so these are the three major contributions or claims that they uh, intend to make and they intend to achieve through this uh, paper. The first one is to demonstrate the potential for one shot semi-supervised learning, which means that you only have one label example per class and they want to reach the accuracy which is comparable to the fully supervised learning and they did this on two data sets. The first is the CIFAR-10 and the second is the SVHN which I'll discuss later in the presentation. Uh, the next contribution is that they wanted to investigate whether class balancing techniques would work for one-shot semi-supervised learning and they also introduced uh, some class balancing techniques that they uh, claim to improve the performance. And the third and the last contribution that they have made in this paper is that they try to find iconic uh, prototypes for each class and they say that refining uh, these prototypes would uh, substantially improve the performance of the model. And through these uh, major contributions, they make this conclusion that through uh, rigorous uh, empirical evaluations, uh, they are able to provide this evidence that uh, labeling large data sets is, is not necessary for deep learning uh, neural networks and uh, maybe five or ten samples, labeled samples per class is just enough. Now coming on to the BOSS methodology, which is the core of this paper, but for that we will first have to understand what fixed match is and for understanding the fixed match loss, we will first dive into the nomenclature. So for instance, you have an uh, class classification problem. So for that, you will have chi. Chi is just basically a set of uh, a batch of B labeled examples. So for uh, every labeled example X, so for every uh, image X, so for instance, you have a cat, then you have an associated label with it. So these are just labeled examples. So chi is basically a batch of labeled examples. Then you have new, which is a batch of unlabeled examples. So you just have an image and you don't have an associated label with it. Uh, now new is equal to RU times B, which uh, RU here is just a hyperparameter that is giving you the ratio between the number of uh, labeled examples to unlabeled examples to the number of labeled examples. Uh, PM Y over X is basically just, uh, it's a class, predicted class distribution. Uh, produced for every um, every image x. So for every image x, this uh, for every given image, this is the associated uh, label and this is the probability distribution for that. Uh, HPQ is basically just the cross entropy between the two probability distributions P and Q. And uh, lastly, the fixed match uh, loss function consists of two loss terms. The first one is the supervised loss, which is for the label data. And then there's the unsupervised loss, which is calculated for the unlabeled data. Now coming on to what exactly the fixed match loss is. So since the first term is the supervised loss, we'll uh, get into that first. So LS is basically just a cross entropy loss between the true labels and uh, the predicted labels for a weakly augmented label class. So you just calculate a cross entropy between uh, the true labels that you have and also the probability and between the probability distribution for uh, the labels that you predict on an augmented version of that image. So this is the supervised loss term. Now coming on to the unsupervised loss term. Here you're calculating the cross entropy between a weakly augmented uh, label so what you do is you feed in a weakly augmented uh, version of this example and you feed it into the model and you get a uh, prediction for a lot of classes and you take the maximum uh, maximum uh, class for that and then you say that okay this is the pseudo label for this weakly augmented image and then you simultaneously also uh, get like a strongly augmented version of this sample image. You feed it into the model and you get certain predictions and then you uh, calculate the cross entropy between these two. Now this term in the loss 
uh, unsupervised loss is basically just telling you if you want to include the sample in the loss term, and that would be on the basis of this uh, scalar threshold value. And then the total loss is just uh, the summation of the supervised loss and the unsupervised loss, and the lambda here is just uh, a hyperparameter. Now the BOSS methodology consists of three things which I talked earlier. It is prototype refining, then you have class balancing, and then you have uh, self iteration. So the first one is prototype refining, as I already talked about. So what we claim is that all of the semi-supervised techniques that have been uh, used earlier, they rely heavily on labels, the data set labels. And these labels are just uh, randomly chosen. So you just randomly pick an example based on these labels and you don't really look into how good a representation is that label for that particular class. So what they say is that uh, it won't be as burdensome for an expert to manually go through some, a few uh, examples in the data set to find the iconic example for each class. So they're saying that uh, they don't need to rely on randomly choosing uh, an example on the basis of labels, but it would be better if you manually sift through the data set and you find an iconic representation of that class. So for that, they come up with this uh, three-step technique. So first you review a small fraction of the training data to manually choose the class prototypes. Then you make a training run, and then you examine uh, how uh, the model is performing for each class. And then you see that, okay, if uh, this particular class has a very poor performance, then what was the prototype like? And if the prototype was bad, then you go back, you revisit it, and then you refine the prototype. And then after uh, prototype refining, when you choose like a better representation of the class, you see that uh, accuracy is improved. Now, after prototype refining, we come to class balancing. So how they incorporate class balancing is uh, basically just incorporating it into the unsupervised loss function that I talked earlier in the fixed match loss function. So what it's saying is that the algorithm now computes the pseudo labels for all the unlabeled training data set. So what it's doing is it's keeping account of how many uh, pseudo labels have been predicted for each class. So CN is basically just the count of uh, each pseudo label for an un unlabeled uh, training example. Now what you do is the, the unsupervised loss remains exactly the same. It's still between uh, calculating the cross entropy between the strongly augmented and then a weakly augmented image. But the only difference here is in the threshold value. There it was just a static uh, threshold, but here it's a class in a class dependent threshold value. So what I mean by that is that um, you want to oversample minority classes and what you do that by choosing uh, this threshold value. So if you have a lot of predictions for a particular class then the count value would be higher for that. So for most frequent classes, the threshold would be tau. So it would not, so the threshold would be tau, but uh, for minority classes, it would have a lower threshold so that you can include more number of samples for the classes that doesn't have a lot of examples so that uh, it would balance out other classes. Then they also provide a modification for this where they uh, use a normalizing factor and the divided by the count. Then there's uh, another class ba balancing algorithm where they count only, they include the count, which, which is only the count of the most uh, confident pseudo labels that the model is predicting. And the fourth class balancing algorithm is basically just a hybrid of the first uh, class balancing algorithm and the third one. Now that we've discussed the above two, we come to self-training. So self-training is, uh, very popular in semi-supervised learning. In a uh, broad view, what it does is that you feed the model a certain number of labeled examples, you train it on it, and then you provide it with unlabeled examples and you let the model predict some pseudo labels for this unlabeled data. 
and then in the next iteration you use these pseudo labels and the label data and then you uh, feed the model uh, you train the model on these pseudo label data as well as the label data and then you let it predict more labels so this is uh, essentially what this uh, training iteration do now here what they do is that they don't just include all of the pseudo label data but they only include the pseudo labels for which the model is the most confident so after the original training run the label data can be combined with a number of highest prediction samples for each class and a subsequent self training iteration run can be uh, then run on a larger label data set because it now uh, consists of the label data and the most confident uh, assumed label data and then you uh, retrain the model on this and then you don't really need like thousands of label data and they say that it, the model would perform better with this as well. So now that uh, we have like a brief idea of what they're doing, I would um, move on to the experiments and the results that they've achieved. So as I talked earlier that they've used uh, CIFAR-10 and SCHN for their techniques. CIFAR-10 is basically just a very small 32 by 32 colored images and uh, 10 depicts the 10 classes that it has. Uh, and they've run this for a fully supervised learning as well. So they have uh, all labeled data. And uh, just to make this comparison between the semi-supervised technique and the fully supervised technique, and they used a ResNet uh, 22 model, and they've uh, achieved this accuracy for the CIFAR data set and then 98.26% for SVHN data set. So first we'll talk about how the model performed on the CIFAR 10 data set. So for the prototype refining technique, what they observed is that they created these uh, one, two, three, four, five sets, and each set had a different prototype for each of these classes. Now, what they observed is that the third set performed really well, which indicated that uh, this set had very good prototypes for all of these, except for the cat. Now they observed that uh, the set two had a very bad prototype for aeroplane and a very bad prototype for truck, which is, and these numbers are just accuracies. So they got like a 0% accuracy for glass truck and a very low accuracy for airplane. So what they did was they went back and they refined the prototype and this uh, set six is basically just a modification of set two where all of the other prototypes remain the same but they changed the prototype for airplane as well as truck and they, they, they saw that uh, the accuracies went up greatly. So from 28 they were able to uh, get 80% accuracy for airplane and from zero they were able to get a 97% accuracy for truck just by changing the prototype uh, of that particular class and simultaneously the total accuracy is also improved. Similarly for the fourth set they had a bad prototype for a cat and a dog and when they improved that and they refined this prototype they were able to achieve 54% and 86% for the cat and dog classes and simultaneously from 72%, they were able to achieve an 83% accuracy. So it shows that uh, prototype refining, since this was done on uh, set two and four and the refined uh, sets were six and seven, so they considerably performed better and they had uh, good results than the original sets, which is basically the claim that they were making. Uh, then they're saying that more importantly, this balancing of accuracies along all of the classes can uh, be used to generate more uh, better models to generate uh, better labels for set training. Uh, coming on to how their model performed for class balancing. So these are the accuracies for fixed match. And this in the square is the accuracy for when they performed the compile purge. Now these four are the balance, uh, class balance techniques that I talked about earlier and they were able to see that they saw almost like a 20% increase in accuracy just through class balancing. So 
the class balancing method one worked well for set one and two, whereas uh, for most of the cases, the hybrid of one and three, which was the class uh, balancing method four, worked uh, considerably well for all the other sets. Now, an interesting thing to notice here is that uh, for classes three, six, and seven, as I talked earlier, that class three was a very good, had very good prototypes. So it was performing greatly on almost all of the classes and it had like a total accuracy of uh, 86. And then these were the prototype refined sets, which were also able to get like 82 and 83% accuracies. So coming back to these three, they were able to see that uh, they had over 90% uh, of accuracy and the variance was also pretty low for all of these good representation uh, prototype, good prototypes for all of these sets. Coming to the last uh, phase of the BOSS technique, which is self-training. So what they observed is that uh, just with, so the plus five, plus 10 and plus 20 here represent that along with one, uh, labeled example, they included the most confident five uh, pseudo labels. Uh, similarly, here with just one labeled example, they included around 10 uh, pseudo most confident pseudo labels, and they were able to see that uh, it, it was able to achieve like a 94.8 percent, and in the above above 90 percent, if we look at it. So they claimed that it could, uh, the accuracies that they were able to achieve with the self uh, semi-supervised learning would be comparable to fully supervised. And as I mentioned earlier, that they ran the similar model for a fully supervised training, for fully supervised model as well. And they were able to achieve 94.9% with that, considering that they were able to achieve these accuracies for um, the semi-supervised technique, which is uh, pretty great. And they say that, uh, in practice, this accuracy should improve as you go on incre increasing the number of pseudo labels, which makes sense. So those were for the CIFAR 10. Now we come to what they saw for the performance on SVHN. So SVHN is just basically uh, house number images that have been taken from Google Street View and they uh, are used to recognize digits. But the thing with this data set is that it's not uh, the best quality. So it contains like very poor quality images. And uh, they thought that because of this poor quality images, uh, the semi-supervised technique would not work as well uh, as it would have on the CIFA 10. But to their surprise, it worked even better. And they were able to achieve like a 97.4% uh, plus minus 0.2% accuracy with the class balancing techniques that they used. Uh, although it's not as good as the fully supervised uh, training technique, which was able to achieve 98, around 98%, but they were still uh, able to achieve like a 97%, which is only uh, a percent lower than fully supervised learning. So it worked well for this data set as well. So to conclude, they wanted to say that uh, the BOSS methodology, even though it uh, relies on very simple concepts like just choosing iconic or uh, training samples with minimal background distractors and employing class balancing techniques and using self-learning just with the highest confidence uh, pseudo-labeled samples, they were able to achieve an accuracy that was uh, very close to fully uh, supervised learning. So with this, they wanted uh, to say that there is evidence uh, that you don't need to label thousands and hundreds of uh, examples to be able to generalize better for classification problems. And with this, they uh, said that all networks have a class imbalance problem. So examining the class accuracies relative to each other would uh, provide better insights into how the network is training. And since you are, uh, you're choosing different prototypes uh, for each training sample, you see that how it's affecting the training. So it gives you like a very atomic uh, view into how every single sample is affecting the data set. So these were the insights that they were, they were able to draw from this paper. Thank you for listening. I hope this was helpful.